So, um, friends, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to panel two. As you can see, I'm not Professor Sunil Amrit. Um, sadly, he has a family emergency, so he uh, just contacted us this morning and uh, gave us his apology. He has to go to hospital with a family member. So, um, but I'm delighted to welcome you all back. I hope you had a nice uh, break and uh, welcome you to the second panel of this conference. Uh, we already heard uh, this morning from uh, Professor Lamont about how stigma manifests itself in different ways across different uh, discriminated against communities. And this is exactly the focus of uh, this, e this afternoon's panel. We have, um, again, a, a rich slate of people, and I should say, by way of apology to those of you who've traveled from so far and prepared you know, for this uh, conference, that it is always a very difficult trade-off. Um, the trade-off between having less people talk for longer or more people talk for a shorter time. And so, greedily, we've gone for the latter alternative, and that's why we're having to rush people. It's really a shame. But we know that in the coffee breaks and before and after the formal sessions, you will all carry on the conversations. And we really see this just as an opportunity to begin a conversation rather than to uh, complete it. So again, forgive us for the, for the rigid timekeeping. So um, I'm not going to actually waste time by um, making long introductions. You have the names of your panelists uh, on the program. Um, and each of them is going to contribute something very special. I think what is very interesting about our panelists is the diversity, the disciplinary diversity, the geographic diversity, the um, different levels of seniority, which is again something that we always try to uh, encourage. We have people who are extremely eminent, well-known scholars in the field, alongside young scholars who are just beginning their careers, and we're very happy to be a forum in which this kind of rather rare uh, institutional egalitarianism um, takes shape. So uh, please join me in welcoming this panel, and I invite you to um, listen carefully to the presentations. So we'll go in the order of the program. We'll start off with Professor Rostas, who is the chair of the Romani Studies program at the Central European University, who's been a leading uh, intellectual on Roma issues in Europe. Some of you will have seen the wonderful journal that he and his colleagues have produced. We're very happy and fortunate to have him not only as a as a panelist today, but as actually a close collaborator with our, with our center. We've learned a lot from him and really welcome his, his partnership. Um, our second speaker, speaker is Angela Codge, who's Assistant Professor of Romani Studies and the Academic Director of the Roma Graduate Preparation Program, also at the CEU. So great to have Angela here with us as well. Thank you for coming. We then have Victoria Rios, who is a singer and songwriter and a Romani activist, now based in California, I think, mm -hmm. but previously um, a student here at Berkeley's, uh, um, which, as some of you know, is the best uh, higher education institution for people who study um, certain types of music, and so uh, Victoria was a student there. Our next panelist is Aline Miklos, who's a doctoral student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, so another one of our Brazilian contingent who we're delighted to welcome. And finally, Leila Savic, who is a journalist from Canada. And then we will be hearing from uh, Professor Michel Lamont, who you already heard from earlier, who will be the respondent to our panel. So thank you all, and uh, Julius, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for um, attending, and um, I'd like to, to thank uh, Magda and Jackie for uh, organizing this event. Um, when I talked to Magda uh, some months ago, about um, the idea to bring Roma from the Americas and to have such a debate, then uh, immediately uh, I said, oh, we can also uh, uh, bring uh, some of our friends and colleagues from Europe, so why not have a, 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 you know, a wider um, uh, event? 
and this is how uh, um, we ended up having uh, this uh, event uh, here uh, with such a diverse group of Roma scholars and activists from um, all over the world. So um, thank you for making possible this uh, event. I also would like to, to mention that um, our contribution is uh, uh, generously um, sponsored by uh, the Velux Foundation, the Open Society Institute, the Roma Initiatives Office, and the Roma Education Fund. Basically, they are the ones that um, also contributed financially through our program to um, organizing this um, event. Well, um, at CU, when I assumed the position of uh, Chair of Romani Studies, I uh, had to think uh, strategically what we can do. And here it is, we are saying uh, uh, briefly that what we are doing, and I'm here also with my colleague Angela Kotze, uh, what we are doing is um, critical Romani studies, yeah, uh, um, which is also the name of our journal. Because uh, Romani studies appeared as a very colonial uh, type of uh, um, knowledge production on Roma. You can still uh, uh, um, have in some countries um, the name of Romani studies as Romology, the science on Roma. Yeah, so that's uh, an expression of uh, how Romani studies started. And why we uh, say we are doing critical Romani studies is first that we encourage critical thinking and the use of critical social theories in analyzing the situation of Roma. And through this, we produce new forms of knowledge on Roma. Not only that is done also uh, uh, by Roma scholars, we in fact, we are working with uh, our non-Roma colleagues as well, but it's important the kind of message we send. And uh, a very important central concept of our approach is the concept of anti-gypsism. Now, anti-gypsism uh, in the past years is a, a widely used concept, and uh, there are uh, definitions provided by different institutions, uh, some uh, activists, a coalition of NGOs, and so on. I'll not uh, um, bother to tell you all that because you know uh, we have limited time, and I would rather prefer to have a dialogue. Uh, um, but uh, um, I think there are some points to be made when it comes uh, to uh, defining anti-gypsism. I'll skip also the part if this is the right term, but just to have an idea why anti-gypsism is important when it comes to institutions. Um, European Union, in spite of uh, uh, the hate against Roma going on throughout Europe, is still seeing anti-gypsism as part of its social inclusion agenda, as it's part of soft policies interventions, and not as part of the human rights agenda, like, for example, anti-Semitism is. So in that respect, we have still a lot to do. But uh, um, I'll move straight to the definition of uh, anti-Gypsism, how I see it. Now, anti-Gypsism is a special form of racism directed against Roma that has at its core the assumptions that Roma are inferior and a deviant group and which justifies the dominance and oppression of Roma. Now, uh, a lot of definitions provided by uh, um, scholars, activists, and NGOs are just mentioning that uh, anti-Gypsies is a special form of racism towards Roma, but that's uh, kind of uh, tautologic because um, it's like saying racism is racism. So we have to look into the content of it. And there are some key assumptions. And one key assumption is the inferiority of Roma and uh, uh, the deviance. Of course, the deviance is very well reflected on the so-called gypsy criminality. Yeah. Um, but there are other uh, uh, key assumptions on which anti-gypsism uh, is based. One of them is Orientalism nomadism, ruthlessness of Roma, and backwardness. So uh, inferiority, it's um, based on the uh, widespread belief among non-Roma that Roma are less human, that uh, usually 
in reference to Roma, there are uh, widely used uh, 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 forms of animality, uh, wilderness, and animalic habits uh, uh, in the description of Roma. Uh, dehumanization yeah, and objectification of Roma has as an objective, yeah, it was a technique to prepare the ground for uh, the final solution. So we, when we look at this, we should not think that this is a mere rhetoric exercise. We have to look at the consequences. Um, of course, on the discourse on criminality, you are well aware, and the usual assumption is that uh, um, criminality is in their blood. Yeah. They are born thieves, pickpocketing, yeah, and uh, jeeping. Um, let me just uh, emphasize uh, uh, the other four assumptions. Orientalists, you are all familiar with uh, um, Said work, but it is worth mentioning that in Europe, Roma were, or as they, they were described, gypsies were used as a way to strengthen state administration and police. So not only to justify or to strengthen the identity of the white Europeans, but also to strengthen their power. Um, nomadism uh, is a second feature uh, when it comes to um, anti-gypsism. And you know, uh, Roma are restless. They, it's in their blood to go around, to move around. Now, while all this might look like uh, uh, from fairy tales, it has very practical consequences, like for example in Italy, where Roma were labeled as nomadi, nomad people, and therefore that was served as an excuse for the um, Italian government not to adopt any policies on housing towards Roma. Ruthlessness, uh, uh, you know, uh, depicts Roma uh, as people without identity, without memory, and, uh, um, you know, uh, basically without a sense of belonging. Yeah. Uh, academia played an important role in promoting that kind of image of Roma. And of course, here it comes, uh, Roma um, do not have a written history because they don't have, uh, they, they have only an oral culture. Uh, you know, they ignore uh, um, what happened in the past. So for them, Holocaust is, you know, not important and that serves as an excuse to uh, uh, deny uh, Romani Holocaust and so on. Backwardness, uh, uh, of course, Roma are uncivilized, uneducated, and uh, um, a lot of policymakers have a feeling that is their duty to civilize the Roma. And we can still see those kind of uh, uh, policies nowadays in education, when a lot of policymakers are just thinking on how we can put gypsy kids in schools. They don't even think that should be provided the same quality education like all other kids. For them, it's just enough to put Roma uh, in schools to teach them how to read and write, and you know, for, the, for them, that's uh, an, uh, uh, an achievement. Now, um, of course, when we go to intellectual roots of anti-gypsies, we see, on the one hand, the role of religion and of the church, including Catholic and uh, Orthodox Church, in promoting um, the anti-gypsism. We also look at the philosophical roots because anti-gypsism is uh, uh, based on some uh, philosophical conceptions, mainly in enlightenment, yeah? and we could see in practical terms the imposition of those uh, uh, measures um, and ideas in the uh, policies of Maria Teresa and Joseph II in the Habsburg Empire at the end of 18th century. It has also ideological roots, uh, economic and social and political roots. Now, when we talk about anti-gypsies, I think we have to look at it as a system of oppression. This is not something that is directed as a um, simple discrimination against individuals or hate against individuals. No, no, no. This is a systemic oppression of Roma that is based on three principles. On the one hand, domination. The other one, 
is uh, uh, the uh, identification, meaning that uh, only those that are meeting certain criteria at, uh, are worth, or giving you an idea on what is beauty and what is not. Yeah? So therefore, in the European context, if you are white, blonde, blue-eyed, that's called beauty. If you are darker-skinned, you know, that's rather associated with something else. And then uh, centered. Uh, the policies and the, the practices are centered on how to serve certain groups, in this case, white Europeans, and definitely not to accommodate the needs and the interests of Roma. Um, earlier, and I will close here, um, earlier, um, one of the speakers mentioned how to address anti-gypsies and mentioned uh, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Well, I uh, was part of uh, the team that put together uh, such a report. In fact, I was responsible exactly for the part on Truth and Reconciliation com Commissions. If uh, different experience from around the world can serve as a basis to reconcile the tensions between Roma and non-Roma in European societies, I think there are uh, merits to look into those processes and uh, something to learn. But I just want to emphasize that reconciliation uh, 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 it, you know, is based not only on acknowledging the past, but it also uh, 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 compounded by the uh, compensatory measures for what happened. I'll stop here. I'll gladly uh, answer your question. Thank you. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. No, I think it doesn't. It's on. It's on? Oh. Okay, good. On. No, that's fine. I'm good? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm great. Okay, thank you so much. So, first of all, I'm really happy to be here uh, a second time, and thanks for this fantastic cooperation and, and that we organized together. And um, actually, I was thinking about in this morning that. We are here in this very intimate circle, right? And many of us know each other, so what's the point to have this workshop? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I came to the conclusion that, in fact, uh, it has been organized by the two eminent graduate school, Harvard University, Central European University, and, um, and I'm really happy and grateful for our institutions that we rectifying and addressing the epistemic violence, what happened against Roma for many centuries. So I still believe in that, that even though that we are in this very intimate circle, but this event is gonna be archived and our sons and daughters will be very happy and proud of this workshop and conference that what we are doing. So I'm really grateful for you organizing this event. Okay, so actually what I would like to share with you, it's a forthcoming book chapter on gender and racialized social insecurity of Roma in East Central Europe. Of course, I'm not going to read and, and uh, the whole paper, but rather I would like to focus on one part, which is about the gender and racialized discourses uh, in Central Eastern Europe regarding the social, regarding the restructuration of the welfare system. And um, of course we know that most of the scholars who have examined the transition of the political and economic restructure in East Central Europe, and particularly the shift from protective welfare regimes to punitive workfare ones, have largely overlooked the underlying feminization and racialization of social security that have been a key characteristic of neoliberal capitalism. And, um, and actually in my paper, I'm using three analytical perspectives, uh, which are really indispensable to adequately discuss the East Central European gendered, racialized, and classed 
neoliberal governance and poverty. The first, I'm arguing that we have to reframe the narrative of the welfare reform in its Central European countries, and, um, and we should fundamentally problematize, question, and challenge the discourse of welfare dependency. And um, thirdly, we have to critically analyze the discourse on the empowerment of Romani women. Let me first outline what these three perspectives imply before I'm going to go further. So the first perspective involves framing welfare reform in its in his center Europe differently, namely relinking social welfare and penal policies with the intersecting racial class and gender inequalities that have significantly shaped the structure of redistribution policies. So several studies show that millions of people have been pushed to the verge of societies mainly those whose education and working experience were not compatible, right, with the new competitive market economy. Post-socialist regime, increasingly constrained by both domestic and international forces, have diminished state redistribution, restored privileges to specific institutions, such as church or state-supported foundations promoted private education and excluded discursively and structurally those who are deemed as worthless and unproductive, such as gendered and racialized Roma groups. So the shift to workfare-based welfare services significantly relies on behavioralist philosophy. Some specific segments of public works have become a symbol of deterrence, surveillance, and stigma that are particularly attached to Roma in segregated areas. Indeed, long-term employment, unskilled groups have become a surplus or problem population. They are under lock and key through punitive workfare and forced into culturalized and racialized, illegalized, informal gray and black markets, as well as into legal money lending, usury, trafficking, and prostitutions. The second analytical perspective, what I would like to a little bit um, 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 have a closer look, um, questioning the discourse of welfare dependency that stigmatized welfare recipients through an intensive discursive campaign feeding into a racist mindset. The more symbolic discourses of welfare dependency have significantly merged with the material conditions that justify the punitive measures of truncated welfare. The discourse that legitimizes the shift from welfare to workfare contains several underlining assumptions. It is reasonable to pose a question such as, why are debates about poverty and racial ethnic inequality in Central Eastern Europe framed in terms of welfare dependency? How and why has the term welfare dependency become racialized? Why have Romani women become the epicenter of social reproduction in the context of welfare dependency? And what are the racial and gender subtext of this discourse, and what are the core assumptions? The racialization of welfare dependency constructed as a gendered and racialized biopolitical boundaries between white deserving poor and non-white undeserving poor ultimately hampers class solidarity among subordinated precarious populations. Instead of solidarity and defending public welfare institutions, the system covertly promotes the racialization and collective scapegoating of Roma to abstract or even criminalize resistance to neoliberal structural oppression. The term welfare dependency has negative connotations and also evokes the strong emotive image of the welfare mothers, right? We can immediately, you know, visualize that how the welfare mother look like. Oh my God. So, <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm not gonna go to the third theoretical perspective. Rather, I just would like to say a few words about the gender and racialized discourse of welfare dependence. So, 
Roman women actually have always born to the labor of social reproduction to maintain and reproduce the working Romani population. Barbara Leslet and Johanna Brenner have defined the social reproduction as activities and attitudes, behaviors and emotions, responsibilities and relationships that are directly involved in the maintenance and reproduction of life on a daily and generational basis. So much of the literature on social reproduction is embedded in a feminist political economy, frameworks that mainly focuses on unpaid domestic labor, we know this very well, women's economic roles in capital, uh, capitalist societies and whole various social institutions, state market, civil society, household, and the like contribute to social reproduction. However, the social reproduction of racialized poor women has historically always been connected with the relationship to worthiness as defined through social, economic, and political discourses. Bridget Baldwin has explained how economic worthiness has defined welfare policy discourse on black women through the history of welfare in US. Uh, she has com convincingly shown that despite the economic activity of black poor women, they were often described as a welfare queens labeled as undeserving and unworthy of any social welfare program. So basically, um, the US literature on um, how uh, black women, African American women has been racialized and stigmatized as a welfare queen is a kind of reference for us, and um, not a comparative because it's two different societies, but, but still it's a very strong reference point. And um, so iconic representation of Romani women as bad mothers welfare dependents and welfare mothers is a fundamental part of the social narrative that depicts women of low morale and uncontrolled sexuality. With the shift to worker welfare policies, although technically a-racial, right, non-racial, have even more problematically been articulated racially. There are various largely institutionalized aspects that have contributed to the gendered racialization of Roma, including historical legacies, media discourses, public opinion, policy articulation, and last but not least, discourses of welfare reform that have centered uh, on work ethics and duties. In 2013, the Slovak Spectator reported that there, were, uh, there was a well-known public myth according to which Roma abused the social benefit system by having many children, refusing to work, and boosting their incomes from state contributions by making more money than many who are actually working. That was in the quote in the Slovak uh, newspaper. So this myth captured the essence of racialization of welfare. First, this myth illustrates that welfare has become equivalent to support for an undeserving part of the population that allegedly lacks any responsibility and work ethos. Second, the myth depicts Roma as an inferior group that strategically produces children to abuse public resources which have been indirectly supported by ostensibly hardworking non-Roma taxpayers. A similar myth encouraged the Hungarian far-right political party, Jobbik, to propose the elimination of the so-called Megélhetési Gyermekvállalás, which is something like children for cash, or having children for strategic opportunistic reasons, policy, without mentioning Roma, without um, articulating the word of Roma, but using clearly a racializing subtext connect with them. So Jobbik advocated the following in its 2014 general election in a manifesto, and I would like to quote this manifesto and after I'm gonna close it. So we would transform the family welfare benefit system by putting a break on having children for cash and supporting responsible family planning. You see the wording. 
Uh, we could transform the child benefit system so that parents aged over 18 would, from the third child onwards, only receive child benefit through tax reduction. Tax reduction can, do, can work only for those who are working, right? So those families raising children while on social benefits, the unemployed, long-term unemployed and public workfare participants, so these are the ones who are you know, on social benefits, we receive social and child benefits via transfer to social services card, paying by card. And this was the program in 2014, um, which was put forward the Yobi. And I would like to close here, but um, I hope that you got the sense that I tried to connect uh, with, um, with, with major social, economic, and political restructuration that how Roma has been gendered and racialized in Central Eastern Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. That's a really a panoramic and, and uh, very thought-provoking presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we now move on to Victoria. Uh, as we're getting this set up uh, for the screen, um, I just want to thank Magda and Harvard FXB so much because in my personal life, coming to this conference two years ago was really the beginning of the end of disenfranchisement from a place of higher learning and bringing myself uh, into the world of academia as a Romani woman. Before I was in academia, but not as a Romani woman, and it's been very powerful for me in my life. Okay, so some of these things are gonna seem a little bit like you already know them, but I, I'm going somewhere with it, so bear with me here. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Oh, no. I use me. I have a I have a club a, a, a cord. Oh no. I do have one. Oh, there. Is it, is it an no, I have a. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. So sorry about that. I thought it was charged up. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I'm gonna begin with my speech, and the slides will come because we have limited time. Okay. So. Romani, Romani, sorry about that. Romani Americans confront what is a surreal kind of dehumanization because our chief obstacle is not access to resources or targeted violence, it is fictionalization. Fictionalization, which I'm pushing back on the concept of invisibility, which is a state of being, because fictionalization is something that is actually being done to you, it's something that's active that's happening to you. Fictionalization functions to encourage erasure, deny representation, further exclusion, and delegitimize our movement. America's legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Movement is a convoluted narrative that perpetuates racial injustice and silences protest. To dismantle anti-Ziganism in the United States, we must deconstruct how racism is rationalized to protect privilege and come together as Romani people to raise a united voice in pursuit of our common objectives. Racism is, wishing these slides would come up because I stayed up so late finishing them. <laughs> oh, well. Ojalá. Well, we'll see. Okay. So, um, racism is one of the most debated. Uh, okay. Racism is one of the most debated issues in our country, but we don't have a common working definition. We lack a consistent definition, and achieving equality is impeded by our differing definitions. Uh, minority groups who are experiencing being punished for the alleged behavior of any one of their phenotype understand that it is a function of racial hatred, de dehumanization, and a system of oppression. The majority, having the privilege of only ever having been held responsible for their own actions, imagine that it is an individual exchange. And accountability uh, to solely individual behavior extends to presume that, being, that racism or being racist is a cognizant individual choice and, and, uh, and not the result of a system maintained by collective behaviors, agreements, and assertions of superiority. It follows that any unintentional affront is not the responsibility of the doer and doesn't merit remedy. Consequently, what is legitimately racist is defined by how the offender feels. <laughs> <laughs> what is legitimately racist, so, 
what's determined, which is validity, is how they feel. How the person in the minority group feels, not relevant. Okay, so, white America uh, assumes entitlement to authorizing what qualifies as racism. Lack of intention to harm equals complete exoneration from reproach. Illogical as it is, in American race relations, the injurer defines the injury and the report of the injured is suspect, a comparable metaphor. One person punches another person in the eye, but it is the puncher, not the punched, who tells you how much it hurts. Okay, further, racism must be committed by a racist, that is an identity, and that is a shameful outlier, and if you're not racist, if you're not identifying as a racist, and you do racist things, that's now an oxymoron. So, that's not racist, I didn't mean it that way, is now the catch-all way to deflect responsibility uh, for racist behavior, because they didn't, they didn't realize it. So in this ideology, a person is actually never responsible for being racist because they never meant it. it that's not how they felt when they did it. So it, it didn't happen, right? Okay. So, uh, and that's a determination that they award themselves. So that is the fallacy that finds people saying that they get a pass because they have a black friend. They distance themselves from the identity in place of responding to the actions. And that is the way that they get out of it. Okay. The... Um, the identity is declared and then they are free. And the gratuitous privilege of the entitlement to the definition is not acknowledged. Okay, so moving right along. Um, the system is constructed uh, from bricks of individual actions that have a parallel limitless immunity because I didn't feel that way, okay? And that goes right along with an imagined need for vigilance of abusive power in reporting instances of racism. This comes from the myth that non-whites have are dishonest. There is a pres presumed duplicity of anyone that is not white. So now there's playing the race card, but that's not racist, but we have to prove it, we have to validate it, right? And that belongs to the white majority. And now checking somebody's privilege is the actual attack because it's erroneous character assassination. That's what you're doing. You're now insulting someone. And grievances are met with rage, ridicule, accusation, punishment, and refusal to change. And it is here that America's love affair with the fictional gypsy rears its ugly head. Okay. Every Romani American has encountered the maddening insistence on the fictional gypsy and the staunch refusal to acknowledge our ethnic minority. In a system where lack of intent equals immunity, this means complete dismissal of all points of contention. The entitlement to this supposed folk character, and I push back on that, this supposed folk character is passionate and bizarre. It's very strange. And even champions of social justice who claim pro progressive politics are oftentimes the worst offenders. They have the greatest attachment to being able to normalize and create acceptability for intense appropriation and stereotyping. They insist that the fictional gypsy is the definition of gypsy and that Roma do not exist or that fictional and ethnic gypsies are not mutually exclusive. Since assumed duplicity of minorities invalidates experiential reports, an actual, physical, Romani person in their presence explaining who and what we are is not enough proof that we exist. Okay, and so that entitlement to the fictional gypsy, that attachment to that character, now yields an, an actual resentment for Roma in trying to confront and combat that idea. Okay, when Americans do actually agree to accept our existence as valid, which happens sometimes, they always remember to announce that, well, I, I didn't know, I never knew, that's not my fault, I, I didn't know. However, this and that their ignorance, of course, merits forgiveness. This supposed folk character is constructed wholly and entirely from age-old archetypes of Romani people and is named with the racial slur for our people, okay? Americans deny awareness, oh, Americans deny awareness uh, of, of our ethnicity and they celebrate uh, gypsy jazz and Django Reinhardt and flamenco and they dress up every year on Halloween. And basically what they're saying is, it's, it's not that they don't know, it's not my responsibility to know. I don't have to make that connection because it's of, not, of no consequence. 
Even if gypsies are Romani people, my desire to appropriate is harmless, and I enjoy it, so I'm not going to stop. But here we go. Oh, I so hope I can get through all of this, you guys. Uh, fictionalization is dehumanization of the highest consequence. It is the conclusion that we are not an ethnic minority and do not deserve human rights, but we are make-believe and we deserve nothing. And once it's confirmed, it's open season. We are incessantly demoralized by strange and exotic uh, caricatures of a, cost a costume minstrel, minstrel. Romani women in particular are sexualized, they're drawn as a femme fatale, they're exoticized. We are de we're demeaned and we're ridiculed if we object, and it's everywhere. On the news, in school, in books, TV shows, movies, common language, song lyrics, fashion lines, dance and music, uh, names of businesses, it is entrenched in the American psyche. It is not invisible, in my opinion. It is entrenched in the